Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Amber, and on behalf of a suitable agency in Sundar Nursery, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to today's session of Suitable Conversations at Sundar Nursery. At a suitable agency, our love for all things books is what inspired the idea for this series, and we are extremely grateful to Sundar Nursery for their enthusiastic support and encouragement in making this happen. Without their collaboration, this series would not have been possible. And now, for the event we've all been waiting for. Ramchandra Guha will be in conversation with Nandini Sundar on the itineraries of a historian. Ramachandra Guha is a hugely acclaimed historian and biographer based in Bengaluru. Nandini Sundar is an eminent sociologist and co-editor with Srinath Raghavan of A Functioning Anarchy, Essays for Ramchandra Guha. Now, without further ado, let us all welcome our speakers with a round of applause. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's an extraordinary pleasure to be part of this conversation with Ram. It's an honor. Uh, Ram Chandra Guha is someone who has been an inspiration to many of us um, from his early work on the environment. Uh, I personally have used his uh, Unquiet Woods as a model when I was writing my thesis and I've encouraged all my PhD students as well to use his work because it's a model of lucid writing, of summing up different kinds of theoretical positions and moving on to make an argument. Uh, his subsequent work, as we all know, has moved from the environment to um, contemporary history, to biography, to cricket, uh, circling back to some of the themes that he's taken up earlier. And uh, in all of these different spheres of writing, Ram has done what many people would have wanted to do in an entire lifetime. He's managed to traverse all these different fields and write spectacularly uh, interesting, readable, fascinating books. Um, for all their lightness, they're packed with dense, uh, you know, historical backing, with uh, evidence, with footnotes. Um, so Ram is really a people's historian, and uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, this chance to have a conversation with him. So let me just read out some of the books that, uh, just to remind us, because this is really not just about his most recent book, Rebels Against the Raj, although we'll focus on that a lot in today's conversation. But also some of his earlier works, just to jog people's memories, though I'd, it may not be possible. His first work, The Unquiet Woods, was about the Himalayas. Uh, then he wrote uh, you know, a couple of volumes with uh, Madhav Gadgil, which are being taught in universities and used as standard texts on environmental history across the world, uh, the fissured land and ecology and equity. Um, Savaging the Civilized, his work on Vera Elwin was something that um, really uh, marked an intervention in uh, biography writing and it, I personally couldn't put it down all, I mean I read it all night at one go, it was such a fascinating read. His work on Gandhi, um, we all know, has uh, really charted new territory on Gandhi, if at all that was possible. Um, work on cricket, I will not comment upon. And India after Gandhi, again, is an indispensable introduction to India's contemporary history. Uh, Ram is very, very modest, so I'm not, uh, you know, He's extraordinarily generous with his advice to younger scholars, with the time he gives. And for someone who's you know, received um, as many prizes and recognitions and awards as he has, um, you would never see it from you know, just knowing Ram. So let me just read out uh, some of Ram's awards. They include the Leopold Hedy Award of the American Society for Environmental History, the Daily Telegraph Cricket Society Prize, uh, the Ramnath Goenka Award for Excellence in Journalism, the R.K. Narayan Prize, the Sahitya Academy Award, the Fukuoka Asian Culture Prize. He's been awarded the Padma Bhushan and an honorary doctorate by Yale University. In 2019, he was recognized as an honorary foreign member of the American Historical Association. And since then, there have been several more as well. So uh, I'm not going to read the entire list. So let me just start by asking Ram uh, something about his current um, book and the context in which um, that book is arriving in the world today. Uh, so in Rebels Against the Raj, which is um, a collective biography of um, 
whites, shall I say, Americans, uh, Britishers who came to India, made it their home. Uh, he talks about uh, a kind of time when um, there was a lot of traversing to and fro, passports and boundaries were not as hardened as they are now. Uh, Indians went abroad to participate uh, more freely in India's freedom struggle as well as other causes uh, like the Spanish Civil War. Ram writes about a reverse migration. Do you think that that kind of intellectual cosmopolitanism is not avail has been in a way paradoxically closed off after India became independent? Well, uh, not entirely, uh, Nandini. Uh, the book is dedicated uh, to our mutual friend Jean Dres, who is, of course, uh, India's leading econ development economist, but born and raised in Belgium. Uh, there are other examples, including in this room, I see uh, in, in this lovely uh, uh, space, open space, I see uh, somewhere at the back, Gillian Wright, who has um, illuminated uh, our understanding of India's literary history. I mean, she's as Indian as you and me, though I'm not sure what her original nationality was, British or English or Welsh. I'm not precisely sure. It doesn't really matter. It's her work that matters and all the incredible insights that her work has given her. So we, ha of course, uh, there have been times uh, in our uh, history of seven and a half decades when we've been more open to influences from outside uh, and times when we've been less open to influences from outside. So the emergency was a time when we shut ourselves off. Today, maybe, maybe we're living through a, another wave of xenophobia. There have also been times in our history where we've been open to refugees. If you look at what happened uh, with um, the, you know, uh, the, the Hindus and Muslims fleeing East Pakistan after the brutal military crackdown of 1970-71. And if and to contrast that with how we treat, for example, Rohingya refugees today. So, I mean, sure, I mean, all societies, large, complex countries go through periods in which they are relatively open, relatively closed, uh, confident, secure in what they stand for, and hence willing to embrace uh, interesting, original, progressive ideas from outside. Or, on the other hand, frightened, insecure, paranoid, and hence close themselves off. So, I think it's uh, it a lot depends on who we are. So my book is about seven foreigners, but it begins with two epigraphs, one from Gandhi and one from Tagore, which tell us a little bit about why those seven foreigners could make their home here and uh, contribute so creatively and richly to our country. So a lot depends on what Indians are like, you know, our encounters with the rest of the world, whether they're economic, political, cultural, intellectual, spiritual, uh, and what kind of, you know, mutual reciprocal benefits we can get or wish to get. It depends on us, you know, and I think uh, Gandhi and Tagore were special kinds of people. And I think, of course, these are these, non, these seven individuals are remarkable in their own right. It's their own journeys. But there was this open minded capaciousness that ironically, when we were ruled by the British, we were able to practice. Thank you. So you talk about um... I mean, you do say in the book that it's been a long time in the making. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how the different characters chart your own trajectory as a historian, because they draw on different aspects of your work. And there's no cricketer uh, who's coming. I mean, what are the IPL people buying, uh, you know, foreigners to work in India? Well, that's not mm. entirely true. And cricket also comes in, which I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. But that's, you know, Nandini, uh, uh, this is, you were very... Uh, uh, you know, uh, you said some very nice things about my book on Elwin. And uh, Elwin changed my life. Uh, as you know, I was a very indifferent student of economics and uh, was looking for some kind of alternative uh, forum to express my intellectual ambitions. And I found read Elwin and then discovered anthropology and sociology and history. So I think I, all of me went into that Elwin book. And, uh, you know, I say in the preface to the revised edition, which was published some years ago, that uh, of course, since then I've written several books, and I say that, you know, parents are not supposed to have favorites among their children. And pro but this is, as an author, this is probably my favorite book. You know, it's not the, obviously, it's not the book that sold the most. It's not the book that has the most impact or created the most controversy. But it means something special to me because of what, uh, because of the fact that Elvin changed my life, and of course, his own journey was so incredible and interesting and complicated. A missionary from Oxford who comes to India, leaves the church, joins Gandhi, leaves Gandhi, works with Adivasis, 
and that is an Adivasi woman writes incredibly rich ethnographies, which uh, uh, the department you belong to, uh, uh, you know, the great scholars of that department did not consider to be proper anthropology, which made them more appealing to me. Uh, and so on. But uh, while I was writing that book on Elwin, I always wanted to write a sequel. Well, I wasn't sure how many people I'd include. You know, it could be 10, 15, 20, but a larger history of extraordinary foreigners who made their home in India in the late 19th and early 20th century. And uh, my Elwin book came out in 1999. And the next year, I was invited to give a series of lectures named for Elwin at the Northeastern Hill University in Shillong, uh, which is the town in which Elwin himself spent the last decade of his life. And I gave my lectures on what I call the other side of the Raj, which is a term my teacher Shiv Vishwanathan had coined to describe white people who are not general civil servants, uh, exploitative planters, etc., but who are actually uh, making themselves at home in India. So I wanted to write this complimentary uh, kind of a sequel to my Elvin book for a very long time. Then I got distracted into other work and uh, I wrote India after Gandhi, which took a decade and uh, then I wrote my Gandhi biographies, which took another decade researching them. But all this while, uh, whenever I was in an archive and I found something on an interesting eccentric foreigner, I filed it uh, in my notebooks under a subject heading, Other Side of the Raj. And all this kept on accumulating. And uh, in 2018, when the second volume of my Gandhi biography was published, I returned to all those notes. And uh, then I decided that I had enough material to write this long delayed sequel, and I would focus it around uh, people who had actually courted arrest or been deported. You know, so I didn't include bridge builders like C.F. Andrews and Sister Nivedita, who are of course remarkable in their own right. I decided uh, so that I could focus the book around an identifiable theme, only to include those who transgressed completely and fully. And the last thing I'd say uh, uh, about how and why this book was written, that one of the characters in this book is B.G. Horniman, uh, who is uh, a fascinating uh, 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 character. He's principally an edit campaigning journalist and editor. But I was introduced to B.G. Horniman because the great newspaper he started, now sadly defunct, called the Bombay Chronicle, uh, contained some of the best cricket coverage in the first decade of the 20th century, and sec first two decades of the 20th century. So without my love of cricket, Horniman would not have featured in this book. So even though I think cricket, I think there's one line about cricket in the whole book, but I think that's also part of this journey. Okay, so all these characters, and Vera Elvin in particular, um, clearly you like them, you have great admiration for them. Um, and... Perhaps you could only write about Spratt because he was quote unquote cured of communism, as you say. Um, there's also some other nasty lines about communism being kept, um, you know, receding into his past. But um, I think our common um, friend mentor, Andre Bete, said that Ram only writes about people's um, positive side. He, you know, writes about them in. Either he likes them and then they're always good. But um, So could you write a biography of somebody that you disliked? Could you write one of Godse or Golwalkar, for instance? Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I don't, the seven characters in this book, obviously I, I generally warm to them, but I am not completely blind to their faults and their angularities uh, and, and so on. And likewise with my book on Gandhi or likewise with my book on Elwin and uh, you know, his, his treatment of his first wife and so on. So, uh, but yes, I mean, uh, I would only, I think, write about people I am broadly sympathetic with. Uh, I think both Godse and Golwalkar deserve their biographies written by scholars who can place them in context, who can talk about their influence, uh, who not don't come under the sway of their ideologies. They are important historical figures. Uh, Bo uh, Go uh, Golwalkar more in his lifetime and good say now posthumously. Uh, I am of course now not a young man, so if this if I was 25 today and had the same politics, you know, so let's say I, I mean, as you know, I mean, you said something about my views on communism, uh, but it's hard to say what I detest more, communism or Hindutva. It's hard to say. I think it's probably Hindutva, but it changes kind of day by day by day, you know, 
So I'm I'm not sure what it will be tomorrow. I mean, if something some nasty things come out of some communist country, I, I don't know what I'll think. But let's say I had the same politics today, and I was 25, right? I think I might actually have considered a book on the life and afterlife of Godse. But I'm 65. Uh, you know, I don't have that kind of. I mean. So I took all my life to write on Gandhi, really, you know. So uh, I would, of course, have to learn Marathi, which I don't know. But I think, yes, I mean, the, the answer to your question would be, I will not write on Golwalkar and Godse. But uh, there's no reason why someone who is not a Hindutvavadi, but a young historian who understands the historical significance of what Godse represented and what he represents today, would do a kind of book I think it'll be a service to scholarship. It'll also be a, you know, uh, uh, it'll contribute to the understanding of where we are today. So if someone came to me and said, a young young scholar came to me and said, I'd like to write about Godse, what advice would you want to give me? I'd give that person purely scholarly advice. I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't bring Sadhvi Thakur or whatever her name is into the conversation. Or, uh, you know, uh, Nalin Katil, who's the president of the BJ, uh, state union of the BJP in my own party, who's also praised Godse. I won't bring them in. I say these are the reasons Godse is interesting and intriguing. These are the kinds of sources you should begin to look for. And I'd love to read your draft manuscript and comment on it. So I'll certainly do that. I mean, it is an important uh, uh, historical theme. Uh, biographies of influential people, important people whom you dislike. I mean, that's the reason why there's so many books on Hitler. I mean, in the last uh, decade, there have been at least four or five really rich scholarly books on Hitler, you know, with new material, each a thousand pages long. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I to, I mean I, let me say one last thing, uh, uh, Nandini. Now, when I was uh, 30, for example, I mean, when the RSS was marginal and so on, I was wondering if instead of Elwin, who, who was the kind of nasty character I may have wanted to write on, you know, it actually may have been, uh, I, I, I can't say, I mean, I, 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 sure, I mean, I think y your your remark and Andre, Andre Bethe's criticism or observation has some, there is some merit in it. Generally, biographers are attracted by people they broadly like because what writing a biography means is that you suppress and submerge yourself, your individuality, your personality, your ego, your for someone else. You're spending five years, or in some cases, 10 or 15 years, making another person the most important person in your in your professional life. So I think most biographers would tend to uh, 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 go in the direction of choosing subjects with which they are broadly in sympathy. So if somebody were to write a biography of you and try and explain your intellectual trajectory from environmental uh, research to Gandhi and you know also how would you sort of chart this uh, travel or no I think no one should waste their time writing a biography of me I've had a very ordinary life you know uh, I mean whatever is there is in my books uh, you know for good or for ill uh, a person who could be mentioned is uh, Professor Dharma Kumar who was both a relative of mine as well as a friend and of course a teacher or the late Anjan Ghosh my sociology mentor uh, whom you also knew. I've been very lucky in having people, older people, uh, and not only Indians, though mostly Indians, whom I met at a formative stage in my life who've oriented me in the right way or in interesting ways, uh, who've stoked my mind, who opened it to new ideas, and who are always open to being challenged. You know, I think I was very fortunate in not finding a guru. Just older people I could con converse with. I mean, Madhav Gadgil, uh, who is India's greatest ecologist and who's, who's now been working on his autobiography, which may come out in a year or so, and I, uh, uh, I urge all of you to read it whenever it's out, uh, is an extraordinarily democratic scientist. You know, he's not someone who is a typical Indian male authoritarian, which is what most scientists tend to be. I mean, India's most famous living scientist is also from Bangalore. And there's a circle named after him in Bangalore, to which, to whose inauguration he came. Now, he's typical, he's absolutely typical of, of, of the genre, right? And Madhav Gadgil is not like that. So I was very lucky to meet uh, people like that. And I think uh, they shaped me. And they also shaped my, I suppose, because I knew people of that kind, uh, uh, they shaped my, um, 
uh, how I relate to younger people, you know, because I could always argue with dharma and fiercely. Uh, and that's why, you know, I'm happy to learn from and engage with younger people. So I think it's very important. I mean, I, I, it's very important not for a scholar, not to be part of a political party, not to be part of a school, and not to attach yourself too closely to an intellectual mentor. You choose half a dozen intellectual mentors rather than one. So if you're, I mean, but that's one um, kind of aspect that might go into making up your, uh, that would go into making a biography, right? The people who've influenced you, but what actually led you from environmentalism to Gandhi? And another question that I want to ask is um, whether there were periods in, I mean, for instance, the 80s when you started your work on environmentalism and some of the characters in your book who've also, I mean, in this book, who've, you know, like um, Sarla Ben, for instance, who's been in influential in um, Uttarakhand. Have there been periods in history that have led you to do certain kind of work or was it something in your own intellectual trajectory? Since we're talking about itineraries, could you yeah, just trace sure, your absolutely. own? Absolutely. Um, well, that's a very fair question. You know, uh, a lot of it is uh, chance and contingency, you know, which plays a part in history and in the life of the individual historian. So I was, um, I mean, I discovered Elvin when I was doing an MA in economics. And I was doing uh, an economics project in an aircraft factory in Orissa, which employed Adivasi workers. And I was studying the productivity records of uh, Adivasi workers, which is what development economists do. And uh, I went to a tribal village one Sunday, and there was a Odia veterinary doctor called Das. And Dr. Das had an interest in anthropology. And he told me, where have you come from? I said, sir, I've come from Delhi. And he said, long ago, there was a young man like you who came from very uh, far away to these hills in Koraput, and his name was Veria Elvin. Have you heard of him? No, I hadn't. I went back to the library and discovered Elvin and abandoned the economics. I mean, an abandonment, which I like to say was uh, benefited me, but benefited economics much more. You know, So I think uh, that uh, there's no question that they, it was, we were spectacularly ill-suited to one another, the subject of economics and myself. Now, likewise with environment. I mean, what happened was, I was doing a PhD in sociology in Calcutta and juggling with what kind of project to take up. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, should I uh, go to Jamshedpur and study steel workers? Should I go to rural Bihar and look at agrarian relations, the kinds of things, you know, sociologists uh, uh, generally do. And there was a visiting scholar from IIM Bangalore called Jayanta Bandapadhyay. And I was chatting to him about who came to Calcutta. I asked him, you know, what kind of, we talked about what kind of thesis I could do. And it turned out that uh, uh, he found out I was from Dehradun, and this is 1981. And he said the Chipko movement started just eight years ago in 1973. Journalists have written about it, activists have written about it, but sociologists have not written about it. So often it's just that kind of accident, you know, and, uh, uh, and kind of at least when it comes to Elwin, which is actually my entree into biography, my first biography, and my work on environment was really meeting Dr. Das and Dr. Bandubadia respectively. But then, of course, it sparks something in you, and then you try and find out more yourself, and you get more deeper and deeper involved. And where do you get involved more and more? I mean, this is, I mean, you are, a, of course, a much better uh, and much more courageous field worker than I am. But I think when you get hold of an idea, uh, when you get hold of an idea, I'm sure this is true of what you tell your students as well, your research students, when an idea strikes you and it captivates you, it intrigues you, how do you follow it up by immersing yourself in primary research? You go to a village or you go to an archive or you look at reams and reams of old microfilms to find out about B.G. Honeyman. You don't, if the idea captures you, your next step should not be to go to Google and search JSTOR about what uh, the scholarly journals have said about journalism or environment or cricket or tribals or whatever, right? Which is often the default default um, mode in which graduate students in certain American universities work, possibly even in certain Indian universities. So I think that's, if an idea strikes me, I want to find out what are the papers, what are the archives, and of course, uh, that's what you would do, uh, that's what you've done all your life with field research, you know, you've, uh, so... Yes, at some stage you'll read the scholarly literature, you'll read theoretical stuff, and you'll try and locate your primary material in some kind of analytical framework. But the joy of finding out new facts 
hidden, uncovered facts. I think that's what drives me. I mean, that's the my main motivation, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, it's that curiosity uh, that kind of has driven me uh, all my life. Uh, Gandhi, I've lived with, you know, for so long that at some stage I had to write about him. So I'd say my work on cricket and my work on Gandhi came from my own uh, orientations and interests. But ecology and Elwin, I was just lucky that people pointed me in that direction. So talking of Gandhi, many of the people in this book are people who have worked closely with Gandhi or had or been influenced by him to leave their countries and come here. Um, so given how important Gandhian thought was as an intellectual project, what do you think accounts for its failure Great. subsequently? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. I think there's probably a whole book to be written about that. But... Two or three things. What is, uh, you know, Gandhi was a, a relatively contested figure in his lifetime. I mean, there was a great aura about him. He was the so-called father of the nation. He was the most influential leader of the freedom struggle. But even in his lifetime, there were people arguing with him and debating his ideas. They were not getting much traction because Gandhi was so powerful, so influential, so dominant. After his death, it's these dissident perspectives on Gandhi that have got influence. Now, this, so that's, I think, one, one obviously, aspect, you know, that, uh, and from different directions. So, you know, Gandhi was criticized by the Hindutvavadis when uh, uh, he was alive. Now, the Hindutvavadis are intellectually and politically dominant. Gandhi was uh, criticized by Ambedkar when he was alive. Now, Ambedkar is rightly so, you know, uh, the exemplar of Dalit assertion and not Gandhi. I mean, and I think that's absolutely appropriate that it should be Ambedkar. But sometimes... In the Ambedkar assassination of Gandhi, there's a certain uh, lack of uh, acknowledgement of what Gandhi also did to further uh, the cause of the abolition of untouchability. You know, of course, uh, when it comes to economic policy, people see Gandhi as a kind of an anti diluvian Luddite and so on. Uh, now, the other thing about Gandhi, uh, which is why I think uh, Gandhi belongs, in his lifetime, he belonged to everyone. It is after life, he belongs to no one, because there's no sect that can claim Gandhi. You know, um, the... Uh, you know, the Maharashtrians can claim Savarkar, the Bengalis can claim Bose, the Dalits can claim Ambedkar, etc., etc. Gandhi belongs to no one because Gandhi actually is, in that sense, you know, uh, kind of beyond identity politics. Uh, however, having said all of this, uh, and then also finally, before I come to my last point, there's so much of Gandhi available. You know, there's 90 volumes of Gandhi's collected works and his life was all in the public domain and his, the editors of his writings put it out all, all out there. So there's so much to read, digest, criticize, argue with, cherry pick, if you wish to demonize him, uh, and so on. The last thing I'd say about Gandhi is that Gandhi is a universal figure. Uh, unlike, unlike many of the names I mentioned before this, he is a universal figure. And uh, this is an insight I owe to my uh, friend and colleague, Gopal Krishna Gandhi, from whom I've learned so much about Indian history, is that... Like the Buddha, Gandhi was born in the subcontinent. And like the Buddha, the subcontinent might expel him, uh, extinguish him, but he'll be born again somewhere else. So I think Gandhi is a universal figure. He's affirmed and avowed in many parts of the world. And Indians might, of course, forget him or scorn him or, or defile him as they're doing now. Now, I, I hope some aspects of what, to me, I mean, I approach Gandhi as a scholar. But there's some aspects of Gandhi that are enduringly relevant. And I wish some of his non-Hindutva critics would pay attention to them. You know, today, there are two, there are four or five, I don't want to put any kind of hierarchy about the challenges our republic faces today. But there are two major challenges our republic faces today. Uh, in, and if we wish to meet those challenges, overcome them, combat them, we cannot do without Gandhi. The first challenge our republic faces today is the increasing stigmatization and demonization of our fellow citizens who happen to be Muslims by birth. And on that issue, on equal rights for Muslim, on Hindu-Muslim harmony, on not abusing the powers of the state to harass and intimidate Muslims in particular, there's all, the Indian who did most to challenge that was Gandhi. And I think even his critics on the left and the right 
who at least share this pluralistic idea of India should take their clues from Gandhi. I mean, I'm not, I don't see myself as an activist. I'm not an activist. And I'm not generally on the road protesting. But the reason I protested in 2019 was because I'm a biographer of Gandhi. I mean, it, that's really the reason. I mean, the other reasons too, I was horrified what, what had happened to the students uh, in this city and the attacks in Jamia. So that's one thing. The other, other critical challenge that our republic faces today is of course the question, question uh, the challenge of the abuse and the degradation of the natural environment. And there again, I think of all the great uh, modern Indians, Gandhi is tells us the most. You know, he anticipates uh, the environmental crisis of modern industrial civilization more acutely, more presently, and more pointedly than anyone else. So, I mean, this is as so far as I'll preach the virtues of Gandhi. I mean, as a as a scholar, he endlessly fascinates me, and I hope one day to write about maybe his afterlife. I've written about his life, about his complicated and contentious afterlife. I hope I'll be able to do that. So I'll come back to a question I wanted to ask about the afterlife in the form of the constructive work that uh, many of the people in this book were engaged in. Um, the fact that I don't think, I don't agree with you necessarily that Gandhi had no one uh, because there is a whole network of Gandhi and ashrams, etc., yeah. who seem to have lost their intellectual and Absolutely. political force. But um, what I want to come back to this um, point you made about uh, protesting because... Can I answer that first question? Yeah, first? sure. That's you're absolutely right, Nandini. Uh, that the Gandhians after Gandhi let down Gandhi. Okay, uh, and uh, they went into they ritualized Gandhi, they memorialized Gandhi, they set up ashrams, they did their daily round of spinning and that kind of stuff. But if you look at the preeminent Gandhians after Gandhi, and I'm particularly thinking of Vinoba Bhave, who was really the main leader of the Sarvadaya movement. Hindu-Muslim harmony and the abolition of untouchability never figured centrally in their politics. So among the reasons, I just want to quickly put that in, among the reasons uh, Gandhi, uh, you know, uh, kind of lost his visibility and his relevance in India is because of the Gandhians who really didn't understand his message. No, um, yeah, that answers uh, the question that I was asking. But to come to your own uh, role as someone who protests because Gandhi... Uh, Inspired. Every day. Well, not every day. Not every day. Well, I think a lot of people might see you as a contemporary rebel against the contemporary Raj. Uh, so, how do you see the discomforts uh, or how do you see the tensions between doing intellectual work and protest against a uh, regime? Yeah, so I, I, I only did it that day. Okay, I should explain. You were uh, dragged away. You yeah, were that's okay. That... Mid interview, like today, you could be dragged away. <laughs> Yes, that's that happened. I mean, that's okay. And I did see. I but by so I I I feel I, I, this is a lesson Madhav Gargil taught me. Uh, he said, of course, you know, you write on issues of public importance. You should write in the newspapers. Uh, so I I do that, and uh, I try and get my newspaper articles translated so they appear in eight or nine Indian languages. So they reach. I try and write clearly and simply, not jargonized uh, sociological prose. All that you do. So you communicate your ideas to a wider public. Uh, when do you go beyond that? You know, I have in recent uh, months, uh, in several interviews I've given, uh, expressed my personal discomfort with the term public intellectual. You know, other people may call me a public intellectual, but I don't like calling myself a public intellectual because as our mutual mentor Andre Bete might say, uh, a public intellectual is someone who is more public and less intellectual. All right, now, so I hesitate. I'm a historian and writer and columnist. Now, when do you go beyond columns? For example, when do you sign uh, uh, a collective letter? Uh, I mean, for every collective letter I signed, I probably turned down 20 or 30 and people get angry. When do you go and protest? I think, for it, uh, I think it's important that scholars intervene in the public sphere about things they know about and they have some credibility and have done some work about. So in my case, it is freedom of the press, uh, which includes attacks on not just journalists, but intellectuals and universities. It's, of course, forests, which I worked on. It is Adivasis, and it is Hindu-Muslim harmony. That's about it. So uh, uh, that's one. For example, if, we, if I may go back to uh, what happened in December 2019, when I was dragged away, 
the next year there were protests about the farm laws and the year after that and i was asked by many people to be on uh, in public meetings uh, discuss these issues and i told them i have not studied agriculture uh, what views i have on the farm laws are not interesting or credible by themselves i may have views as a citizen right and but like sir aap us din nikal gaye the dharna mein so i said i understood that so i'm not coming on a anti farm laws dharna i'm reading what the press is saying i'm imbibing it i'm making my own judgment such as it is but i am not writing on that issue i'm not protesting on that issue because i lack the competence and credibility i am not an all purpose activist and finally uh i don't believe in celebrity endorsement okay let me give you one example uh there's a uh, uh, which happened today okay and i won't take names but i'll give you a sense there's a very great fellow resident of my city who died several years ago a far greater than me shall we say but let me take his name i mean it's only fair that we take his name girish karnad okay girish karnad uh uh an extraordinary figure and the range of his cultural influence enduring cultural influence far exceeds what a historian can do i mean i think that's what creative people novelists and poets and playwrights do and i knew him a little bit uh and i was my great privilege to have known him as a friend so uh after he died i wrote about him in the press now there is a large public commemoration of his work and the organizer insisting i speak and this i've been having a, a kind of a, a public commemoration not in bangalore in some other city and the whole whole of today i've been exchanging polite emails with the organizer of that explaining why i can't speak and giving them names of people who understand his uh, his plays his acting uh, his directorship much better than i and who are actually from bangalore but obviously they'd want to put it on their poster ramachandra gua speaking about girish karnad even if he's speaking utter bullshit about girish karnad 50 more people will come to hear him compared to the real authority arundhati nag in this case who's a great actor who runs ranga shankara which is the name i suggested so i think it's very very important to have this um, not be swayed by what you can do to have a sense of where you're actually contributing in some constructive way to what's going on and this is what madhav gadgil taught me you know uh, and it happened very early on in my career where i took a signature petition to him uh, about uh, a nuclear plant coming up in karnataka to oppose it and he, if it, the petition had been on the decimation of biodiversity he would have signed it if it had been eucalyptus replacing teak forest he would have signed it because he understood that he said ram i don't understand this my authority is as an ecologist i am not an energy person i said no madhav it's a military industrial complex the nuclear energy is connected to the bomb which is connected to the super power rivalry you must sell it he said ram i am not an energy scientist i do not understand it and he told me this a hell of a long time ago now i don't think i've digested that lesson fully because there are probably a few letters i sign i should not be signing you know and that may be because of you know the influence of people like you on me which counter account counter balances the and, and my own kind of crazy impulsive personality but i think this is where i think uh, yes i agree with you dandiri i mean i think uh, uh, you can in, in a country like india you can't only be in the university uh, you can't only be writing for your peers uh, in times like this where it is a, a horrific nasty regime uh there are times when one has to speak out but choose your battles wisely is what i would say okay so one since we're talking about uh battles one and itineraries um my grandfather used to joke um knowing ram as a young man that the road uh, that the route from delhi to calcutta where he was then studying went through amdabad and it was very strange that it should go through amdabad because ram's um then um uh, part i mean sujata who then became ram's wife lived was at nid so you know ram always chose these complicated itineraries so i want to ask you ram since i know that a lot of people are waiting to ask questions so this will be my last question to you um what do you think sujata's intellectual and aesthetic influences on your work has been i should just tell people who have seen sujata through her work but may not know um that you know who the spirit behind is a lot of the visual urban landscape that we see has been designed by sujata keshavan uh the airtel logo the jk bank logo the fair and lovely creams uh you know 
any number of things that we just take for granted as now visual landscape are actually products of Sujata. The Bangalore Airport design. logo, the Bombay Airport logo, the Delhi Airport logo, Vistara logo, we can go on. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, so what do you think intellectually? How is she? Yeah, and like, also Keshava and Iravati. How yeah, so I think, you? you know, I I mean, she, it, I talked about accidental encounters, right? Now, um, uh, I met her through a friend in Ahmedabad. We fell in love. And uh, in 1980, I had two choices. And it, actually, what I'm telling you is linked to your, the question and the pose you posed about intellectualism versus activism. And I had two choices. One was I had got into the Institute of Rural Management in Anand in the first batch. And I had been very inspired by Dr. Kurian and cooperatives and Manthan. And I wanted to actually go and build cooperatives through uh, joining the Institute of Rural Management. And I also got into a PhD program. And Sujata said, if you want to marry me, you have to do a PhD. Because this, as a graphic designer, I can't live in a village. I have to be in a city. Right. And that, and she, and that is pure luck. But I think it's really her. She's a person of extraordinary equanimity, balance of judgment, a fierce views. I mean, I think, I mean, she detests bigotry and religious fundamentalism probably even more than I do, you know. And uh, But I think it's her, uh, uh, whenever, I mean, unfortunately, she doesn't have the time to read drafts of all I write. But if there's a particularly contentious column, she's always the first reader. And in that sense, uh, apart from, of course, living together for 40 years and the arguments and debates we've had, uh, so I've been deeply fortunate, of course, in, in having um, you know, um, a life partner of that kind. Uh, I suppose, invisibly, uh, she's also, I mean, I probably lacked an aesthetic dimension totally. I don't have a particularly developed one uh, now. But I can see, I can at least appreciate the landscape here vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, uh, a kilometer away, which the distinction may not have struck me had I not been married to Sujata 40 years. And we are a very argumentative family. I have, as my children have grown older, uh, of course, I've learned a great deal from them uh, about, you know, how to think through complicated intellectual and political choices. I've been very lucky, Nandini, in, of course, in my family, but in my mentors, in my friends, uh, and I'm deeply grateful for that. I mean, many of them are no longer around, uh, and I think of them, you know, all the time. I mean, someone who died, uh, whom you knew also quite well, who died uh, last September, uh, Keshav Desi Radio, who gave me a sense of uh, what a public so truly uh, in skilled, brilliant, fair-minded, public servant could do and what he taught me about life, about this country and of course about classical music uh, of, of which he was such a, a great scholar. So I'd say that uh, there have been many, many people I have met who've been, as I said, mostly been Indians, not only Indians. I mean, I, if I may just at the end, again, mention someone whom you know, who's the Catalan polymath, Juan Martinez Alier, uh, who's uh, been an extraordinary uh, uh, inspiration for me. Uh, in his ability to transgress intellectual boundaries, uh, in his sense of mischief, uh, and so on. So I'd say a lot of what I've done has been made possible uh, by the people who have befriended and, in a sense, kept me going. Okay, so um, thank you, Ram, for... Um responding on that and the others so let me open it up for questions now um i thought an interest while we just yeah. wait for the mic sure, sure. i thought an interest uh, when you since you mentioned keshav um as a kind of um annex or epilogue to this uh, perhaps there might be something to be written on those who served the raj yes but also worked for india's freedom in many important ways absolutely i mean I, absolutely i think mm. public servants both in the british period too and afterwards absolutely and i think uh, for sure for sure yeah uh, good evening, sir. I have read your work uh, via my course of political science. So I believe that you do not really belong to just economics or sociology, but also to his students of history and political science. However, I have a question for you. Um, so my question is, uh, does the political environment changing over the decades, uh, the political environment changing over the decades affect uh, the readers or your audiences in any ways? And if it does, how do you cope up with those challenges? So, you know, uh Obviously, the political environment is changing, right? But as a writer, there are two things, two, two things I believe. I don't say I practice them fully. The first thing as a writer uh, uh, on politics, I think it's very important never to identify with a political party, all right? Now, 
I may be more critical of party A than party B. That, but that does not mean I'm hanging around with people of party B. I believe it's very important for a writer or an intellectual. You can have a beliefs, philosophies, but never be in a political party. In my case also, since I read a column, never to meet politicians, particularly in Delhi. Okay. Now, so I come to Delhi, I meet intellectual colleagues like Nandini, fr friends. Uh, I go to bookshops, so I may, but I never meet politicians. But if they come to Bangalore, I occasionally meet them, but in a place of my choosing, which is Koshi's Parade Cafe uh, of St. Mark's Road, where I have actually met Congress ministers, CPIM intellectuals, and RSS ideologues at separate times, of course. Uh, but that, I think, is the first thing. That's the first thing, that you must never identify, so you'll never remotely see me with any politician, uh, you know, uh, in any way, you know, e publicly, privately, no chance. You know, that's not my job. You know, I can study their ideas, their works. The second thing about how you, uh, about your, how, how does the reception of your work changes? That's not in your control. You know, don't be uh, swayed away by the fact that today it's popular for whatever reason, you know, and tomorrow it's not popular. You know, you have to do your duty, you have to do your craft, and uh, as honestly and sincerely, uh, as you can, as your intellectual tools allow you to, and how they are received is well beyond you. So I think I don't really care for that. Uh, good evening, sir. Firstly, thanks for introducing me to Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay. I'm really grateful for, uh, to you for that. And secondly, um, in your book, Makers of Modern India, yeah. you've mentioned how most, uh, not most, but a lot of leaders have their... Um, the thinking has been um, sort of borrowed from Western influences like Marx, Lenin and other influencers. And you've also uh, exposed your readers to a lot of original thinkers. Yeah. So my question is what, um, as a professional, as a student, what should I do or what should we do that stimulate our uh, originality in thought or that attacks as a catalyst to original thinking? You know, I really can't, it's tough for me, you know, again, I think uh, it's, it's, everyone must find their own way. You know, uh, that book, uh, I first wanted to write it in my own voice. I wanted to write a history of Indian ideas in my own voice. Then I found all these, I said I have to write JP and Ramana Loya and Golwalkar and Kamla Devi and Fule and Tarabai Shinde and speak in their own voice. Uh, now, I'd also say, obviously, I have some regrets about whom I didn't include. Uh, I, fe I feel there were two people I should have included in that book. You see, no book is complete. I wish I'd included Vivekananda. And I also wish I'd included uh, M. Vishweshwaraya, who was a, uh, a technocrat, who kind of inaugurates a line of scientific, technological, managerial thinking, which starts with him and goes through to... Uh, Baba, Manlobe, Sarabhai, on to Nanda Nilekani. You know, that technology will reshape society. So, how do I, st I mean, I can't really tell people how, how to stimulate, you know. Again, uh, my job is to understand, interpret, document, start a conversation, certainly not end it, but not prescribe. I mean, I always find it difficult, uh, unless I have, a, I have a piece of writing in my hands. So, if there's a young scholar, who's writing a book on Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay and gives me a 300-page manuscript, I can say this is the kind of changes I think it requires. But I can't be anybody else's moral conscience. I mean, that's, firstly, I'm probably not a good uh, uh, guide in that respect. Uh, and I don't believe, again, it goes back to what I said about the guru culture. You know, I think there's a problem with the guru culture that you tell younger people, ye karo, aisa karo, ye mat karo. You know, read my books, make up your mind. That's all I would say. Okay. Hello. I hope I'm audible, sir. Good yeah. evening. Uh, so I'm a student of environmental studies at Delhi University and I've taken up a dissertation uh, on the fiction that Amitav Ghosh has written, yeah. mostly on the lines of in climate fiction as it is called. Uh, so I would like to ask you what your take on fiction is, like the influence that it can have. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, I uh, myself would never write fiction. I read fiction. Uh, uh, and... Uh, I, as I said about Girish Karnad, I believe truly original playwrights and novelists provide far deeper insights into uh, the human condition than mere historians can. 
so in that sense, I read fiction. I try to read fiction. Um, usually, that is not set in India because I'm dealing with India all the time in my professional work. I'm reading about Indian politics, Indian history, Indian sociology, Indian leaders. So in the pandemic, for example, uh, I've read a lot of Tolstoy and George Eliot and some other stuff. So, but they're two different uh, uh, genres of writing. History uh, should not borrow the techniques of fiction writing. Novelists sometimes borrow the techniques of historians and put them to very good use. But I can't really comment on fiction per se with any authority, except to say, uh, uh, just as I like listening to music, I like reading a good novel. But my views on what uh, you know, uh, what fiction says, I should not be taken seriously. Good evening, sir. Um, so I remember listening one of your lectures where you used an analogy for startup for Republic of India and how you called it a reckless political experiment. Right, right. Um, so can you probably talk about one decision that helped India, you know, be a thriving democracy in whatever capacity it is today? I think the difference between historians and economists uh, is that economists look for one master key. And so often do people that, with a scientific brain. Historians look at multi-causal explanations. There is not one decision. There are many decisions that went into India adopting universal adult franchise, uh, into its adopting a constitution which, uh, which had various uh, interesting features, including affirmative action for Dalits, equal rights for women, uh, you know, uh, linguistic and religious pluralism and so on. Uh, another difference between historians and biographers, and I probably, I'm both, but is that biographers uh, uh, always give a lot of credit to individuals. Like individuals play, an, of course, an important role, but there may be many other factors. So it's hard to say how that happened. You know, many things contributed. Uh, India after Gandhi talks about it, some of them, other works uh, 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 by political historians document, you know, other, other contributory causes. But that analogy that I offered a very long time ago about India as a startup, uh, now uh, I may have to revise it now. So the question is, uh, uh, has the startup really flourished? Or has it been, or actually it has been subject to a hostile takeover by some, someone else? Right, now, so it's, uh, Clearly, I, even in India after Gandhi, which came out in 2007, I was qualified in how successful the experiment had been. It was reckless, unprecedented, and I thought modestly successful, which is why I called India a 50-50 democracy. Um, uh, in 2019, August, in a column I wrote, I downgraded it to a 40-60 democracy. Now, two and a half years later, we'll have to see. So, you know, I'm really thinking maybe that was a rather naively uh, optimistic analogy that it's a startup that has flourished. Yes, it was a startup. It was against the odds. Uh, now, the question is where we are going. And as a historian, I can't say. As a historian, I can only say these are complicated, difficult times. Uh, it's a crisis comparable to the emergency or that happened after partition. That's my view. It, these are not easy times. India is going to multiple crises well before the war in Ukraine, which is going to make our lives even more difficult for the foreseeable future. But, you know, why India might have succeeded, why India might fail, again, will look, you, you cannot attribute to a single cause. You know, uh, it was not all about Nehru then, and it's not all about Modi now. You know, it was not all about the Congress party then, or about the BJP now. A large, diverse, uh, divided country like India uh, operates at many different levels, and we have to separate out these different factors. That's the job of a sociologist. No simple answers. That's why, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, that's why, uh, unfortunately, my books were so long, and I wish they were longer, but then you wouldn't be able to carry them. Are there other questions? Uh, Are there other questions? Yes. Uh, one at the back here, and then, yeah? Thank you. Uh, I question. Your take off your mic, it may be easier for me. Yeah, Am I? yeah. My question is about uh, your book, The Commonwealth of Cricket. Yeah, in that you talk about your experiences of playing cricket as a player in your early teens 
and your early 20s before you shifted focus towards uh, social wonder how your life turned as a professional cricketer how different your life would have turned out no uh, <laughs> that's a completely hypothetical question my friend because i was never good enough right now but uh, i'll answer your question different way what did uh, the years i obsessively spent playing cricket watching cricket thinking about cricket reading about cricket dreaming about cricket what did they give me so roughly between the ages of 11 and 21 cricket was my consuming passion from the time i was in middle school till the time i was in the second year of my ma so for 10 years i played very intensive competitive cricket right now what did those teach me i think they were taught me i think uh, the discipline of hard work you know four five hours as every day at the nets uh you know prepares you for eight hours a day in the archives uh the experience of failure of getting a duck but your teammate gets 100 and you win the match right so being part of a team so a team sport particularly and any kind of passion you know i i i often say that historical research and writing more generally is like riyaz is practice you know if someone uh learned classical dance for 8 or 9 years and then abandoned classical dance and became a doctor you know it goes into their practice as a doctor right so i think that's what it gave me i'm deeply grateful for all those years though in retrospect you may think they were misspent because you know the aspects of literature i'm blind to for example i don't read poetry and it's too late to cultivate a taste of poetry at 64 i hardly watch films because what would happen is i'd be playing the whole day and i'm an asthmatic i'd be too tired so i'd come back at 6 o'clock to my ho college hostel room and my friend would come and say ram come there's a reissue of guide and i'd say yaar main to bahut thak gaya hu and film is a great creative uh, you know invention of the 20th century so the aspects of life i've lost out to poetry and film are probably the two most important uh, that had i not been playing so much cricket i could have developed an early taste for right but on the other hand i think it gave me this absolute focus uh that ye karna hai aur dadke karna hai aur din bhar karna hai you know i think that's so, so i'm great i'm kind of grateful for that yeah. okay i'm just going to ask one question and then i'll uh, allow you to ask uh is there any one of your books or maybe you know two or three vignettes of from the books that you think would make a great film because i i can see various images for instance your description of champaran and gandhi yeah, yeah. that would be really good <laughs> so, so uh, <laughs> or any know, of these characters yeah yeah so i think yeah so if you look at uh, rebels against the raj i think the story of meera ben would make a great film so here she is um, you know um, daughter of an admiral uh, gets offers to marry refuses them tries to become a concert pianist fails as a concert pianist finds out about gandhi joins gandhi devotes herself to gandhi in a kind of most abject way then falls in love with a handsome bearded revolutionary uh, who unfortunately doesn't like her then distraught she goes to the himalaya becomes an environmental activist does very interesting important work then in 1959 when she is in a late 60s beethoven returns to her she returns to uh, austria and then inspires the making of the atmaro film so you know uh, you know There's also a title for a possible film on Gandhi. You can call it or on Meera Ben. You can call it Babu Ki Beti, with all that implies. Gandhi had four sons and no daughter, right? Now, so Palwankar Balu, the Dalit cricketer whom I've written about, possibly could make a. So I don't know. I mean, I don't have that visual kind of sense, you know. So I write on the printed page, and a few people have kind of made inquiries, but nothing has come of them. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know, I. I suppose if I had watched more films, my writing would have that kind of visual, uh, visual uh, uh, sensibility. One of the reasons I don't write fiction is I don't have a visual sensibility. For example, I can't capture. I can talk about this room, uh, about this uh, open space, and the different uh, generations represented here, the different modes of dress. I can see it, but asked to write about it, I won't be able to do it because I need the wretched notes I've collected from the archives before I begin to write a book. Sorry, that's my limitation. Uh, can somebody give him the mic? Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hello, Ram sir, and thank you, Nandini ma'am, for allowing us to ask questions. Uh, so, Ram sir, uh, I was watching an interview of an historian recently where he said that historians, as a part of a profession of writing history, have not been able to prevent the oversimplification of history over time, which sometimes is really absurd. The oversimplifications and uh, which is actually then used uh, for propaganda. So my question to you is, is, as a historian, is how historians can do it, or is there any uh, intellectual thought about it? If not, is it the is it the responsibility of only the historians to do it, or the uh, there are other stakeholders as well? Thank you. It's a very difficult, important, and difficult and complex question. You know, uh, I think individual historians have to respond in their own way. You know, though I am a historian, uh, I've never taught in a history department. Because actually, my disciplines are something else, and uh, I believe uh, that more historians who are rigorously trained should write for a wider audience. That's what I would say. Some are beginning to do so, uh, but we live in a time where oversimplification is inevitable, distortion is inevitable, lies are inevitable. You know. Uh, for example, I have a choice now. I'm not young. I'm 64. I've written a few books. I want to write a few more. I keep on getting uh, calls from fact-checking sites and newspaper sites saying, yeah, so-and-so uh, political leader has said this about Nehru, this about Gandhi. Is it true? Is it not true? Now, obviously, one would like to co combat falsehood. As was famously said a long time ago, in the 1940s, well before WhatsApp, an American politician said that uh, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth has got its boots on. A lie is halfway around the world. And that's true of WhatsApp is in India particularly. And the lie spread by this regime and its IT cell particularly. Right. Now, but what do I do? Do I just keep on going around combating it? Or do I try and write, you know, whatever I can for my own intellectual pleasure and for posterity? So I think it's a, we are living in times in which simplification and distortion is very, very easy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the only way a historian can combat it is not by, uh, not by uh, refuting every lie that comes from motivated interests, but try to communicate accessibly, widely, uh, not just in English, but in different languages. That's all I can say. Yeah. Good evening, sir. It was wonderful to be intellectually stimulated by the discussion on the stage. I have a question like uh, in 2015, you famously said that there is a lack of right wing intellectuals yeah. uh, in the public sphere or yeah. the uh, yeah. discussions. Yeah. Do you see the trend changing with the emergence of authors like Vikram Sampath? And I have a second part to this question, yeah. like uh, authors like V.S. Naipaul, yeah. uh, who is also a Nobel laureate, they famously quoted that Indian historians have not uh, have failed to serve the purpose of uniting the country or promoting nationalism and in a way which is to say that uh, to reaffirm in, uh, they have failed to reaffirm indigenous culture after post independence and thus we have there was a mention of fair and lovely so we have these uh, themes of racism self contempt yeah. self hatred in our country yeah. so do you uh, uh, yeah, so these i said all, see I, when i was young i was told we have to write marxist history now I'm told we have to write nationalist history. Now, I kind of understood what Marxist history was, and I did not want to write it. And I don't understand what nationalist history is. I don't understand what glorifying indigenous culture is. There are lots of wonderful things about indigenous culture, lots of horrible things about indigenous culture too. Right. So the job of a historian is to call it as it is. Um, uh, yes, we need writing intellectuals more broadly, but not writing intellectuals who have their photographs taken with the prime minister and the head of the RSS. Right. We need right-wing intellectuals, autonomy, integrity of the kinds I mentioned in that essay. For example, G.S. Gurie, the sociologist of, of Bombay, or Jadunath Sarkar, the great historian of Bengal. These were people with rigorous, scrupulous scholarship, who did their own original research, who did not use purloin other people's research, who were not cultivating political favor. Now, I'll tell you one last thing. I said also in somewhere in that essay that a model for right-wing thought should be someone like Rajagopalachari, but actually they've taken Golwalkar. 
Now, what that will get you is deeply disturbing. We still need it. In fact, that essay was written as a lament that a really creative, vigorous intellectual culture needs left-wing, centrist, right-wing, but not, you know, uh, if, if you need prime ministers and RSS Sarsan Chalaks to promote your books, then don't call yourself a scholar. That's all I'd say. You know, that, I, look, it's, it works both ways. In the past, there may have been people who have been happy to be members of the CPM and, uh, or even, you know, have Indira Gandhi. I mean, there were historians totally allied to the Congress Party, writing official history of the Congress Party. I have always, historians must stay away from this. They must stay away from, ident they must have views. They can be, if you read, please read Jadunath Sarkar. He was an anti-Marxist. Read G.S. Gurie, uh, whom, whose work Nandini knows, who was also a conservative Hindu sociologist. But he was not an ideologue, he was not a party man, and he did not, you know, uh, need to hide uh, behind, uh, uh, you know, uh, party people if he was criticized. You know, I think that's really the important distinction to make. I think none of them would have filed cases for defamation when their plagiarism was pointed out. Yeah, that would be, I think, a proper right-wing uh, intellectual. Uh, hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Uh, thank you for a very engaging conversation. Uh, I am reminded of the petitions that you both filed uh, ba way back in like the late 2010. For, for the out that eventually led to the outlawing of the Salva Jadum by the Supreme Court. So, in the conversation that you said that you don't want to be identified as an activist, what do you think is the role of intellectuals like or public intellectuals? Should they become more activists, especially in these very troubled times? Yeah, and yeah. also given that the Supreme Court has not been responding to multiple sets of petitions that we have had. So, uh, thank you. I mean, that petition was Nandini Sundar, Sundar and others. I am part of the others. Okay. And I say this because she drove it completely. Uh, it was based on a trip we took in 2006, uh, uh, which was, uh, you know, organized by her. And I went partly because it was Nandini, whom I so much respect and admire, partly because Adivasis and partly because Elvin had worked in Buster. Right. So I think, you know, those are the kind of things that um, must lead your so-called activism. It goes back to what I said before. You know, yes, uh, you must write uh, for a wider audience. Uh, if you, because I think this is, if I may just spend a couple of minutes explaining, uh, uh, little, clarifying a little uh, more uh, uh, explicitly some things I've said in response to your question. You see, the Nandini is an anthropologist. I'm a historian. What is common between history and anthropology is that history and anthropology are at once a branch of social science and a branch of literature. So they're not merely anecdotes. I went to a village, I met this tribal, I went to an archive, I got this snippet. They are rigor, analysis, you understand politics, society, social change, state structure. So they're social science. But they're also literature. Because what you find, you can communicate a language with all of you can understand. That's the difference between history and anthropology on one side and philosophy and mathematics and economics on the other, which is in those disciplines, the rigor and complexity of your scientific findings cannot be communicated in everyday prose. They have to be dumbed down, simplified. So historians and anthropologists are privileged enough to do really rigorous research and yet communicate the research in the language that everyone can understand. So we must do that. We must write in the press. Nandini also writes in the press. We must give talks. Uh, we must have our work translated. But we must have our views. We feel strongly about some things, you know. In that case, uh, we felt strongly about the vigilante army that was oppressing the Adivasis. Uh, uh, but do so without allying with a political party or a politician, and do so with intellectual rigor and based on your own deep understanding. Right. So, I mean, yes. I mean, uh, I think that's what I'd say. That you know, it's, it's a every individual, every writer or intellectual has to make up their own stance. You know, I'm telling you what I think. I don't prescribe it to everyone. You know, if there's, if there's a scholar who only wants to do scholarly work and never sign a petition, never come in a dharna, I would respect that. In fact, I would respect that more compared to a scholar who signs every petition and who goes to every dharna. Right. So that's the decision. I, 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 but Dandari should answer that a little bit on, on, on her own behalf. I think... 
But Ram, as he said, very Elvin changed his life. So he went to Bastar in the middle of this conflict to see where Elvin lived as well, and then you know felt that he owed it to Elvin, owed it to the people there to file the case. Uh, so I think he's being a bit. And owed it to my younger <laughs> and far more courageous friend Nandini. So um, I think there was one more question at the back, and that will be the last question we take. Hello, sir. Uh, one of the good decisions that uh, li- led to later success of our. Dep- was the adoption of our constitution uh, yeah. which unlike many other took on uh, equal rights for minorities like women and uh, dalits etc uh, there was one minority that was missed out on and that was the lgbtq community yes, 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 yes. and that is something that of late has been brought up again yes 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 but given the failure of a uh, relative failure of the success of those minorities earlier like we don't we still have to go a long way for rights of women in our communities absolutely as well as for dalits and other lower castes yeah, yeah. do you see any kind of hope in your scholarly view for the lgbtq community actually no. can i ask my question because it was something uh, this was something that i had wanted to ask is that many in your uh, in this book uh, you touch quite delicately but you do touch upon the sexual lives of uh, some of the characters and this is such a refreshing change from a lot of biography which especially of the hagiographic variety that is now becoming prominent where it you know it sounds like people had no sex life at all they had no romantic life so uh could you yeah. talk about why that has gone out of fashion and also gandhi seems to have engaged so much with people's personal lives yeah. and uh yeah. perhaps so, you could ask so one of the characters in in my book was actually gay honiman uh who was who's a incredibly brave editor who was deported by the british for uh, carrying the first reports on jallianwala bag and generally standing up for freedom and he is desperate to come back and he actually used all kinds of interesting um devious ways to come back after 7 years and i speculate did he love india did he love a particular indian or was it both now unfortunately we don't know but it's, it it certainly endeared to me that there was this gay englishman in the 1920s who was in love with india and possibly a particular indian so uh, you know i think uh, again if i'm nandini asked a question about my wife sudhata and i think my sensitivity to uh, the rights of gays comes a fair amount from her also from my children of course uh, you know unlike me she grew up with gay friends partly because of design school and so on and absolutely i mean these were neglected scorn i mean uh, uh uh certainly the constitution i am glad that uh, belatedly some amends were made a lot more needs to be done uh uh, uh i think you know uh, it's a complex business the nego- how do you at different times in our history different minorities have borne the brunt of majoritarianism in the past uh i'd say it was dalits we been generally always right today it may be that uh muslims are bearing a greater branch of upper caste majoritarianism broadly of course there will still be many individual cases of discrimination against dalits in many parts of india uh, in companies in you know in universities and so on but today uh, that's why i think you know again it goes back to why i feel so strongly about this and why i would go on a dharna if if any other ca protest happened because like that's really that to me is i mean the, in many ways the muslims muslims in india what has happened over the last 8 10 years and is accelerating you know i think that is something uh, that is truly terrible and violates everything uh, that our constitution makers wanted you know uh, and effectively the rulers today want to abrogate that constitution and replace it with a hindu first hindu hindus above all kind of uh, of constitutional framework for india and that's why that's in many ways that's what about my country that's what worries me the most today without discounting the the discrimination against other minorities including sexual minorities which you talk i just like to end with um, just quote from an interview that ram had given to uh, john harris um, which was published in a um, journal development and change and he quoted from the poet nisim ezekiel about why he chooses to stay here to do his research to fight the various battles that he fights both on the intellectual front uh, and as he said as a citizen 
Um, he says, I have, I'm, this is Ezekiel, I have made my commitments now, this is one, to stay where I am. As others choose to give themselves in some remote and backward place, my backward place is where I am. So thank you, Ram, for uh, 